equity and to be able to, to carry that with me um, all throughout my career has been a big, big accomplishment. So that, I think that would probably be the biggest one. Yeah, and also for all those people who um, haven't seen your story yet, you have just been put on the New York Soho billboard for Calvin Klein. And that is amazing. All the people who are going to be passing that are going to be seeing you and going to be thinking, finally, there's someone up there who represents us. Absolutely. And, I'm so and proud. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, no, totally. I think it's been a, um, a surreal moment, you know. Um, somebody, um, I guess, you know, across many intersections as a black woman, as a plus size person, as yeah. a trans person, you know, I think it's good for people to see that, you know, somebody like me or somebody that has, you know, those identities are worthy of celebration, are worthy of being, you know, publicly loved, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's been um, an amazing thing to watch, um, you know, people think themselves. I think it's so important. I think that's how we, you know, we learn to um, make a better, you know, society, you know, when we see ourselves and we know that we have that kind of value. You walk differently, so. Yeah, and I think especially 2020 is such a big year because everything's happening at once. Especially Everything. You. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so how do you, I know there's been lots of little movements and big movements in the past, but they haven't done a lot to change the face and everything that's happened is just been building up for a while Absolutely. and I think this is a really big boiling point to where something has the potential to change. Absolutely. But <laughs> there's a lot of people in the media because all people do nowadays because they're all at home <laughs> is go on their phones with the media and they're being bombarded by all of this fact and things. So I think it's very easy for people to just kind of shove on a blindfold and look away for a moment. So how would you, what would you say to the per people who are doing that, but not because not because they don't agree with it, it's more like because they're overwhelmed. With everything. Overwhelmed, yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, I, I, I have, uh, I guess, like a seesaw kind of uh, opinion to it, of one being a person who's marginalized and living in this time. It is hard, you know, it, sometimes, you know, I have to, take those breaks off of social media and, you know, yes. not look at things. Um, the news, I probably haven't watched the news in probably about two months, <laughs> you know, because, you know, it, it, it's overwhelming, you know, it gets yes. to the point where it starts to affect your mental and physical health, right? So you have to be able to know yourself and feel like, okay, I'm going to take a break. On the other side, um, I think we are at a moment of momentum, you can't stop, you know? Like, I think with movements like this, you know, you have these big, like, outpours, and then it kind of, you know, Goes well, back down. down, right? So yes. I think, you know, keeping them up into love and really applying, if you're an ally or if you're an activist, and really pressing those things, challenging yourselves to make that part of your lifestyle and, and yes. not something that's just, like, a, a phase, right? Yeah. Because, you know, the people that are being affected by this are hurt continue to be, you know, whether or not, you know, it is at the um, forefront of everybody's, you know, view of like, what's happening. So, um, I would say push through, <laughs> you know, yeah. be mindful of your body and your mind, take breaks, but also know that it is a privilege as well to turn it off. Absolutely. And I've had to like really, you know, even me and in my identities, you know, I, I, I still know that me as a figure or somebody who, you know, has the pleasure to work, I mean, has the privilege to work every day and stuff like that, I know that there's a privilege in being able to turn that off, but some people you can't. Some people who are living in very heavily police neighborhoods where there are people who are, you know, being come down in the streets, you know, like, it, it is a privilege knowing that I could, can turn that off at times, right? But um, that's why I need to work harder when it's, when I'm in the you know have the energy and capacity. So, so. Yeah. yeah. Do you also think that maybe you, compared to a white cis person or a celebrity, um, have more of a kind of social need 
to say something on the activist front, whereas you're cut. They're not really expected to do that, but you from this area should should do it. Absolutely, I think um, for marginalized people, it, there's no real choice. Um, it's it's not something that can just be put as a publicity stunt or you know something to make my fans feel good. Like it's my survival. I have to, you know. Um, and if I don't, you know. It won't matter if I'm a celebrity, it won't matter if I work at the corner store, it won't work, you know, it doesn't matter because it's a black woman, they see a black trans woman. Um, so it will affect me directly, and it has affected me directly. Yeah. So um, I think for me, it's more of a survival, survival than, you know, maybe, maybe I'll do it or maybe I don't. That's why I explore and challenge, you know, people, um, especially like, you know, um, celebrities who have that platform, especially white celebrities who have that platform, to really put that into their lifestyle and not just, you know, for the hype of it all. Yeah. Someone just put, um, we don't want to be a checkbox, and that is a really good thing to say. Oh and my I God. think it really does filter down to even, say, primary school kids, if they're the only marginalized person in their whole class, they will feel a responsibility to kind of uphold their whole community Absol on their Absolutely. jobs. Absolutely. Yeah, no, totally. The, 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 labor, the labor shouldn't be on the people who are most marginalized, you know, and I say it all the time, but it's hard to implement that when, um, if you're not the person, if, if you're not, you know, making a fuss about it, if you're not out in the streets protesting, if you're not, you know, for, I mean, um, uh, if you're not, um, I guess, you know, really pushing people to to activate their activism, you know. Yeah. You have to kind of do it yourself, you know, so that it, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks, <laughs> yeah. you know. I'm pretty sure, you know, black people don't want to be in the streets every day protesting because they're being killed, you know. I think, you know, people want to live their best lives, enjoy their lives, but, you know, if we don't do what we is. Exactly. That's really what I'm hoping our generation will make happen that if you want to live just live as Absolutely. whoever you are just totally. like just do it, <laughs> I did it. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah exactly when did it first hit that you were an activist as such uh, i don't know that there was like this pivotal moment you know um i recently did a piece of glad and i was thinking about this how so many of us who are activists or advocates you know I don't think it's something that we jumped into. I don't think it's something that we're like, oh, I'll wake up one day and be an activist, you know? Yes. I think it comes from that idea of survival and, you know, having to do it because it's our lived experience. So I think, you know, me, I think I realized it when I, when I wanted to live my true self, you know, live my most authentic self, that activism was going to be a part of me anyway. You know, it's, it's in the clothes I wear. It's, it's in the, um, the pieces that I do. Um, it's in, even in my career as a model or as an actress, you know, everything, every way that I navigate is going to be politicized, right? So I think inherently I'm going to be an activist. Inherently I have to fight for, you know, myself and people like me. So um, yeah. yeah, I think it, I don't think there's one pinpoint, but I think it's a moment when I decided that in order for me to be my most authentic self, I have to, you know, activate um, um, what I want, you know, fight, 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 for, fight for what I want. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I keep seeing how you get so much love, like from all of your followers, oh. from all of the comments I see, it's always like, you're always the best, you're always oh. amazing, and you are, you really are. Um, but you always get, you must get a lot oh. of hate as well, a absolutely. lot of hate. <laughs> how do you deal with that? Absolutely. You know, it has taken me a while, right, to build, build this armor, you know, um, I think that that has come before I've even, you know, gotten to the limelight, you want to call it, um, but a lot of self-love, you know, I practice that every day as much as possible, it's this harder on some days than others, um, you know, um, community. I think community is such an important aspect of my life, you know, the people who I surround myself with, you know, my chosen family, you know, those are the people who build you up, those are the people who are going to take care of you. And when you know you have that kind of support, nothing can penetrate you, right? Nothing can yeah. 
break your skin. So I think, you know, really engaging in um, engaging in family or engaging in chosen family or engaging in, you know, community is super important um, when building this armor. So then, you know, when you are put on a very huge public platform and people are at home miserable on their computers and want to say awful things about you, <laughs> um, it doesn't hurt, you know. I think for me, what I, what I try to um, combat those things is because I don't want a younger generation of young queer people to see that and, and see that I'm not doing anything about it, you know. I want them to know that there is um, love and respect outside of those, you know, comment that those people yeah. don't matter, that they're irrelevant. Um, so I try to combat the hate with much more love, with much more imagery and live my best life, you know. And I think um, the younger, you know, youth queer youth can see that. They do, no they do. <laughs> <laughs> so for our generation and the people who are just getting this first wave of hate that we've never really had before. Um, is there any like one sentence advice kind of thing that sums it all up? Ooh. Hmm. I don't know. That's, that's a hard thing. <laughs> I feel like it's like such a like you live your best life. You're beautiful. You're worthy. You're like those. No, it's, it's a whole list of affirmations that I try to do, and you know, I think consistency with an affirmation is important. I know, like. Um, I always say this idea of like faking it to make it, you know? Every day I have to get up and say that you're beautiful, you're worthy, um, people should respect you, you know? And, you know, if you don't feel that at the time, you know, saying those words and putting that into your, into your memory and your muscle memory and your body, you know, you eventually will believe it and it gives you a shield um, that, you know, like I said, can't be portrayed in you know? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm asking you really like no, harsh this questions. Is, no, um, this is one from our followers. Okay. And they said, "How did your loved ones react when you told them that you were trans?" You know, there was it was mixed bag, you know, um, which scared me at some point. But you know, when you realize that this is something that you have to do, you know, this is something that there's no. There's no other thing, you know, this is me living my most authentic self. Um, it kind of brings down the hit, but there are people who were there with open arms, especially, you know, those who weren't my um, blood family, but my chosen family, my friends, or mostly um, my wife, when I was my best friend, you know. Yes. Um, that those reactions, that love, you know, kind of outweigh any bad. Some of the bad people just don't understand. Some people are concerned about your life because of what is seen in the media um, when it comes to transness, when it comes to queerness. So, you know, once people see that you're okay, once people see that you can still live a life worth celebrating, then those, you know, opinions kind of change. And then those who didn't, you know, those who continued um, to be one sided or be one minded, um, you know, I can love them I say yeah. we don't have to be in each other's lives. We don't have to interact with each other. We love each other. Fall in the spot. I think, especially my friends, some of them, um, they are part of the LGBTQ community, and they haven't told their parents yet. So they're at that phase where they're really nervous. They are terrified of what they might think. Oh my think. God! Yes. And I don't know what to say to them. Like <laughs> I, they, I talk to them, and they're just. It's a hard thing. I think as allies, you know, just being there and being supportive, you know, um, I think people are going to come out whether, um, you know, when, when they want to, when they feel most confident. And I think that's important. I think it's a crucial moment in, you know, in your queer journey because once you are so self-sure and, 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 aware, and aware of yourself, then it makes coming out that much easier, right? I think it's still going to be thing that's going to be a big moment in your life, but it makes it, you know, that much easier. Um, so yeah, just being supportive and being full of love and uh, being a 
you know, giving affirmation, like things like I'm going to be here no matter what, um, you know, really being a friend, a genuine friend, and, yeah. you know, that outweighs any kind of nervousness or, you know, that energy yeah. that tries to come Have like a group behind you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, what about, when did you first realize you were trying this? Like, when did it hit? Um, I think, uh, you know, it's a tricky question because I think I've always been, you know, I think um, I always consider myself like a trans girl when I, you know, I don't think, um, I think the moment that I realized is when people start to tell me that I was something else, you know. Um, I think me and my wife had this conversation on too, um, she's trans as well, and you know, it, I think those moments of realizing, I guess, her transness is when people were telling you it was something that you weren't. Um, so I think, you know, when you know, start to grow up a little bit, and you know, the feminine traits in me weren't as cute to people, or weren't as accepted or digestible um, to, you know, family and friends, and I think those are the moments where I realized that I was different. Maybe didn't have the language for like, oh, I'm trans, but I knew that you know something that people were seeing was something that was going to Yeah, I think that's such an issue. Like in primary school, we don't get taught about the LGBT community. We know it's there. Oh my we god! Know what yeah. it means, <laughs> and it's like you don't get taught about something so basic that so many people are. Oh my god! And what's crazy to me is when you know you have these very conservative adults who are like. You know, kids don't need to know about that, and you know, they, they don't need to know. It's like, kids are so perceptive of different things and have such great, you know, knowledge of things. You know, I have a little cousin who was like, well, you were that before, and now you're this. And I was like, as long as you're happy, like, kind of thing. Like, kids get it. Like, to the point in their head where the parents are like, I never knew you were like this, and you know, before you were this, and why are you not? It doesn't matter, it's who I am now that matters, right? It's who I yes. am. Like, you see me happy there, you see my more authentic self, that should all that matters. But these yes. are definitely, definitely, definitely capable of, you know, understanding gender. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more what they're understanding than anything, you know? I think so many people, especially, you know, conservative folks are like, well, my child's gay because they're walking around in heels or wearing lipstick or my little girl is gay because she was wearing more clothes. It's like, you're not commenting on their sexuality, you're commenting on their gender identity, you know? And I think that is more of the conversation, you know, when we're talking about these young queer kids and why we to do that to our education and, you know, just every day of our life because so we can recognize those um, identities with. Absolutely. Why do you think parents are so scared almost to teach their kids about it or mention it or bring it up? I, 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 I think part of it is ignorance, um, fear, you know, um, people have grown up different ways, you know, um, with very conservative backgrounds, but I think a lot of it has to do with fear, you know. If you see in the media that trans women are being killed or, you know, LGBT folks are being harassed in the streets, why would you want that for your child, right? Um, so I think there, there's, there's a fear, but I think there's also an ignorance, you know, not knowing, you know, what that means. Um, you know, how that affects your religious beliefs or any kind of conservative um, background beliefs. So, um, I mean, some people are just bigoted. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was watching this experiment the other day on Instagram, I think, um, and there was a black child doll and there was a white child doll. Uh, and there was a group of mixed race kids and they were asked to choose which one. Almost all of them chose the white one. Oh, that is so scary. To yeah. Think such a young age and kind of indoctrinated into choosing oh one over the other. Absolutely. There's always that sense of, this is us, and that's you. Yep, totally. That's totally. Yeah, and I think, and again, and that's why I think that, you know, having someone like me, you know, be the face of top of mind right now, it, yes. it ties directly to that, you know, we have no positive representation of blackness, no one has a representation of transness, you know, we're starting to build it most definitely, but it is very small compared to what we see of, you know, of whiteness and or Eurocentric features and stuff like that. Um, so I think once we bring, you know, more that imagery and more the representation, we start to um, see it in the children that 
they to themselves, you know, are beautiful or see blackness as beautiful or see something that's other than, you know, whiteness or Eurocentric, um, that's beautiful too. Exactly. That was really sweet, actually. <laughs> um, no, and I do think it's really important to pass like a billboard, like you say, and just see someone who's not what you would expect. Yes, absolutely. And it does. It sends a message, which is really, really good. Absolutely, I, I say it all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, you know, it's great being Gary Jones looking at this album behind the board, but I think the board is so much bigger than me. I think it represents yes. something that will, you know, really open conversation about how we um, celebrate different bodies, different, yeah. you know, people um, on big platforms. So I think I'm, that's what I'm excited about, that conversation or that opening of, you know, realization that everything doesn't have to be one. Yeah. I think it, the fact that we see this wide variety of representation of the people who are essentially the consumers of those companies, right? Um, but just in general a society that knows that kind of person can be celebrated. Yeah. And you pulled out Victoria's Secret. Um, <laughs> Go you. Go you. Absolutely. That's the right thing to do. <laughs> How did you feel? How did you deal with the backlash? Um, I think at that moment, I just saw it as a necessary thing to do, you know? I think a lot of what the person was saying was, again, ignorance, not knowing actually what to know how things go down. Um, to say that, you know, trans women or plus size women aren't desirable is, is foolish, you know? <laughs> You know, you know, you see it across every board, you know, it may be in a way that's more fetishized sometimes, but I think you know, before it's just like, don't do it. So when I did it, um, I wasn't worried really about the backlash. I knew that I would never watch more work for me to so didn't plan to, didn't really want to after that. Um, so I thought it was a moment of just like radical teaching. Whoever got some out of it, got some out of it. Whoever didn't, um, you know, watch the company suffer it as it did. <laughs> yeah, go you. <laughs> also, talking of um, turning heads, you were also the first black trans woman to produce a film that went to the camp. <laughs> how? What, how? <laughs> I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that is amazing and like, that effed up at the same time. You know, Ken's been out for over 60 years. And after that, I was the first. I was like, really? Really? <laughs> I, you know, I take those accolades very lightly. You know, I, I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing. But I think for me and the community and people of color, you know, it's a really a symbol of recognition of people who already have done it and did get the Sport, right? Yeah. So it's glad that I get to be that symbol, but you know, it was a man for my community. It really was. It was a man for black folks, a man for trans folks, you know, weird uh, ones in the queer community, um, really. Um, and women, women of color, you know, the fact that somebody didn't do it already, it was like, that's. Yeah. But look, let's get down to the nitty gritty of that. <laughs> Why? What, what did that experience teach you about the industry? Um, it taught me that, um, you know, that I had to not be afraid to demand, you know, not be afraid to, to call out what I need um, in those spaces. I think so often, you know, as women, as people of color, as queer folks, we are taught to just be hushed, you know, and be that checklist or that, that checkbox in those spaces. Like, well, we have our black girl, but we are well. You're not supposed to do anything. You're just supposed to be a pawn there. And you know, you hired me to do something, so I'm going to speak. You hired me to do a job, so I'm going to follow through. I'm not going to just right? So I really um, learned that I have to do that in those spaces. You know, really go for it. And essentially, not care <laughs> what the outcome is going to be, because I think once we push, push, push. 
that's always how I've kind of set up my career. You know, I want to break down walls, break down doors, bust out windows so people can walk into a little bit easier than I am. You must find it so frustrating though that you have to be the one to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a few of us, <laughs> not just me, but it, it's a few of us. You know, it does get exhausting. You know, it's hard having to go into spaces and continuously, you know, raise your voice. You know, you never get a chance to enjoy the moment or sit in the moment. I think it's such a privilege to, you know, achieve something and be able to sit and really, you know, swallow it. And you know, for some of us, especially marginalized folks, we have an achievement and then we're looking to the next. We gotta move on to the next, you know, the work is never done. So um, I'm learning or trying to sit in the achievement, sit in, you know, um, sit in the beauty of what's happening. But in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking like, okay, what do I have to do now? What is next? What are you planning on doing next? Oh my God, you know, a lot of opportunities are coming out of this. <laughs> um, yeah. Really great ones to create content, to create art, um, whether that's music or whether that's you know more film or whether that's more modeling. Bigger companies are just reaching out. Agencies are reaching out. So I think this week, as you're just talking about learning to just sit in it for a minute and enjoy, you know, what's happening, then you know, really start pushing forward. You know, really start creating. Um, content and art and spaces that are going to be inviting to people like us. You know, that's my yes. ultimate goal. Collaboration is one of the most beautiful things that we did in this world. So I want to make more spaces where we can, you know, build, essentially take apart what's there. <laughs> no, no, that, that's really important. Um, what's your film about for people who don't know? Okay, so Port Authority is um, a film um, that is about um, a person who comes from the Midwest, who comes to New York, and falls in love with a black trans woman who lives as a Christian follower. She's a woman um, Also, a Afro woman uh, um, trans model as well. Um, so this is her and debut, which is phenomenal. Um, but it really, you know. Um, brings a conversation about um, about inviting people in into the spaces where they're not from, you know. So you have this character who's white, um, a white man who, you know, is essentially coming into the space of this black trans woman and having to, you know, prove himself worthy to be in the space. And I think so often we see in um, films where it's the opposite, where yes. a marginalized person has to, you know, try to mold themselves to be in, you know, the mainstream society. So to see him have to work, to see him have to gain the trust of a lot of people, that's a really interesting thing to see. Um, and it's a celebration of the um, of the underground, you know, folk scene, which is called the Kiki scene, um, which just involves so many beautiful artists and dancers. Um, um, aside from the main, you know, uh, major. Oh, okay, good, I'm still here. Um, these are a lot of um, uh, queer kids, you know, who have this beautiful art form of folk and you know, highlight them as well. So it's a, it's a really exciting film. This just came up. I think it's quite important to talk about this actually. Um, there's more opportunities for gay people than there were before, of course, but it's got to the point where some people around them, because they've seen it suddenly come out of nowhere, they feel like it's kind of intruding their space. So, mm. like, um, for instance, if you want, you want the text box person to be working. And some companies are very biased and they might take that person instead of taking a white male who would really work just as well. But, and then that means white men like that person who just got rejected start feeling this kind of they're taking over kind of feeling, which is completely <laughs> not right at all. Yeah, at all. But, <laughs> but it is a problem. Them, and it's becoming louder and louder. So what do you feel about? 
Um, I think in that situation, um, I think especially for, you know, white cis males, um, they've had the space their whole lives, you know? I think it's an opportunity to realize that, you know, everything should not be centered around them. Um, especially, you know, you know um, I, I, I kind of just take it as, you know, we need to learn how to share space. Right? Even if that means um, you not getting the position that you want. You know, I feel like there's an entitlement that sits in there too that needs to be eradicated. You know, that comes with patriarchy and that comes with, you know, um, this cis het hierarchy. Um, that can be that, you know, they should be the default when, you know, it doesn't need to be, you know? So, um, to those people, <laughs> I say, you know, you know, Work harder. <laughs> work harder. Yeah, that's work, you know, occupy, occupy other spaces because you know everything. Um, you know, you have the opportunity in your life, and you know, for you and your ancestors have occupied the space forever, and now you know there are other people working in. So it works. <laughs> yeah. So you should work. Yeah. And if, I think again. I think again going. <laughs> back to educate it's like you have to learn how to live with people not just absolutely yourself other people in the community cultures from an early age it is absolutely. so so important. it's like this idea of like i want them to have the job but not my job or i want them to be great but not better than me so you know yeah. i think that's where the privilege is to be checked you know this idea that you feel superior to everybody yes the fact that you feel like somebody's intruding on your space when the space should be for everybody and not your space. Exactly. That is really important. And also when you think of, I would say more politics area, um, especially in the UK, when you put people in charge, they are still predominantly Absolutely. white males. Absolutely. That's why I and and that, everyone that, watching that, Corona, they're talking and coming out because you and it, it starts hitting yep. that you're, you are different and you're not, maybe you won't be good enough to get there. And then when you do get there, they're all like, you took my space. You should be guilty. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and that's why, that's why I kind of, the complaint goes in one ear and not the other. It's like, you know, you still occupy the most powerful spaces within society. So it's like, I'm sorry that you don't have the chance to have this as well. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel a kind of obligation to teach people around you, even though you yourself might be absolutely exhausted, but if there's someone who's saying kind of like stupid comment, then you just have this feeling to go and say, actually you're wrong, reason to your wrong. Try educating yourself with that to next time. I, I think I, I try to weigh those situations as much as possible, you know. Um, I do surround myself with a lot of allies who are willing to take that labor more than me. Um, but if I feel, you know, inclined to do so, or I feel like it's harming somebody who cannot stick up for themselves, I definitely will do the But most times, you know, the people around me, before I surround myself with, will jump in before I have to, which is very, very, you know. I think that's the most important part of allyship, that marginalized people should not be the ones who are educating the people who are against them. But then, they should. Yeah, yeah but sometimes, especially with young people, sorry, um, you feel kind of a duty to educate yeah. them because you think, well, if they don't know about it, their parents won't know about it. So but I'm the only person who should know. And yeah. it's this. It's fine the first few times, and then it starts building, and then again, yeah, oh, everything in the oh, choices right. leads to a lot of pain. So how would you say, how do you judge if the situation is big enough for you to intervene? Absolutely. Um, for me, at least, um, I have really taken it upon myself to take a moment to step back, I guess, and is this person going to directly affect me in this moment right now? Right? Or is this person directly affecting somebody that I care about? Or is this, somebody, this person directly affecting 
someone who shares the same identity as you. You know, if you're kind of just rambling to themselves and or talking, you know, at their ass, <laughs> um, I kind of just like let it go. But you know, if it's something that feels like a teaching moment, or I feel like we have some sort of connection that where they can be, you know, educated in that space in that time um, without a lot of labor, then I will take the time to do so. Um, but like I said, sometimes you kind of just have to like let it go. You know, it sucks that you can't change every single person that we interact with. But you know, I think it's more a way how it's going to affect you more than how it's going to affect because I think teaching or educating takes a lot, a lot, a lot of energy. And, you know, if you're doing that constantly, you have to do it to every single person I run into on the street. It's going to, you know, wear you down, you know, you're going to be burned out fast. Where you can, you know, send your message on bigger platforms to reach more people and kind of start the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think conversations like this are really important where absolutely. you kind of pass on the experience. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you do a lot of modeling work. Um, and the model industry is kind of famous for not always taking the thing that comes to them. So how do you use your voice for modeling? So with the modeling industry, I have learned that at least for you know, creative directors, you know, we don't see people of color in those positions of power. And I think that's where it needs to shift, right? Because I think once those people are hired or put in those mm -hmm. positions, then yeah. they have the power of hiring other people of color, hiring um, um, people who are, you know, who are marginalized who wouldn't get into those rooms. Um, I think the medical um, field or the healthcare field is a big one, you know, all of these top yeah. doctors or researchers are all white. And, you know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, like, um, connect, you know, with who they're trying to take care of. You know, I think that's why black women have one of the highest rates of death within, you know, hospitals, you know, because mm -hmm. we have no other black doctors. We have no, you know, um, black women in positions of power in the medical field. So, you know, when a black woman comes to the hospital or, you know, to emergency room, she's less likely to be cared for rather than her, you know, this counter, you know, person yeah. um, coming into the hospital as well, or a brown person, same thing. Mm -hmm. See, what's really interesting is from a white cis point of view and think from your point of view, you've been through a lot of hard things in your life, but they've never, never been because of your race or because of your gender or because of you. And I think to put yourself yeah. in that position and really think about what it's like for someone who's not you is like life changing. Like it gives you a completely different perspective on a lot of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. That the the, yeah. the empathy it takes, right, to really, you know, understand someone who is not like you, it's it's life changing, you know, and even, you know, for me, you know, somebody who, you know, I was, you know, raised in, like, um, like middle class, and, you know, coming to New York was a very big culture shock of, you know, people who, you know, who grew up in different, you know, um, classes than me, you know, whether it was above me or below me, it was just, like, you know, everybody in my town was kind of, like, leveled, you know, um, so coming to a city where there was just a lot of people was really eye-opening and made me, you know, empathize in different ways that I've never explored before. Mm. The sound is out. That really gave you to see more people who are out there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you think that gave you more of an option to see people who are out there? L see other communities? Um, I think moving to New York was definitely a, the the bigger one, you know. I think being into the city and being in different industries, you know. I was in the fashion industry. I was also in the theater industry um, and the music industry. So um, I think moving to a place where it was just so encompassing of so many different people, it allowed me to appreciate culture at such a high level, you know. And it made me want to advocate more, you know, 
Mm -hmm. I really wanted to advocate for people who even didn't share the same identity as me, but who were marginalized or being, you know, um, yeah, disproportionate by the, the system in place. So, you know, you build this empathy or this sense of community that you never thought before, you know, mm -hmm. um, rather than living in a town where everybody yeah, and is I, the same as you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I also think when you're fighting for someone, like I was talking to one of my friends, um, and if you don't represent the community you're fighting for, you have a bigger voice than many of the people in that community. So Absolutely. if you fight for them, that gives them so much, like, extra momentum to keep going. Absolutely. It's so important. Especially if your identity is seen in a position of power. Um, I think it's so important. I think, I think allyship, you know, that's real allyship to me. You know, being able yeah. to, to either speak for or present a space and a platform where those people can see, you know? Because yeah. I think it's a fine line where an ally seems to want to center themselves because they're fighting so hard, um, rather mm -hmm. than, you know, creating space where you can bring people who usually don't have a voice to a space where they where they will have a voice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a balance. It's the idea of stepping back and stepping forward, knowing when to step forward, and when they know, when they, um, also, knowing when to step back and allow you yeah. know, people to speak. Absolutely. I think a lot of people are scared of kind of talking over someone who already represents the community, who knows so much more than them. But then at the same time, they're scared of not speaking out because then a lot exactly. of people are there. So how, how would you suggest you get that balance right? I always say a rule of thumb is if you are a person uh, who is a, in a position of power, right, and you are fighting for a cause that is not of yours, but you are in an audience of the same mm -hmm. kind of, you know, identity as yours, I believe that is a moment to step up, right? I don't think that you yeah. should be arguing about, um, or I don't think you should put the labor um, of, let's say, race or gender on, on a person who doesn't share that with you, right? I think mm. it's your job to do that. So if you are a let's say, white man, and there are a, an audience of white men who are, you know, demonizing, let's say, black people or demonizing queer people, it is your job mm. to step up then to, yeah. you know, to protest, to, um, to advocate for, you know, these marginalized communities. But say if you're in a yeah. space where it is a call of action or whether it's a protest, I think it is your duty to step back and to protect um, the space so that these um, so that marginalized people can, you know, have the space and the, and the safety to, to speak and, you know, really demand what they're fighting for, you know. Yeah, that's really inspirational, actually. And oh, that's really in community or with a group, it makes it that much more easier, and, you know, you can bounce off ideas of how to cope with that inner self so you don't bring it out into when you're fighting, you know. You deal with mm -hmm. it at home or you deal with it, you know, within your little group, and then, you know, yeah. once you guys are given the tools or create the tools for yourself to go out and protest or to go out and be an advocate, um, mm -hmm. you know, you are present to do so. Yeah, and even at home, I have this really good friend who is talking to their parents almost every night about how instead of saying all lives matter, you should say black lives matter, or talking about issues Absolutely. that their parents might not be aware of, and it's so tough on them because they're like 16 years old, but they're <laughs> doing it, and it's totally. inspirational, honestly. Absolutely. And that I think if she's doing it, then there must be so many people out there who, because of this movement, have started realising that it is an issue, and a lot of people aren't aware of it, which is shocking Absolutely. to someone who's lived through it. But so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, I find the empathy from the younger generation, you know, those who are, let's say, 17 down, I find it so inspiring because, you know, I think so often, um, you know, people who are probably my age or a little bit older, you know, start to mm -hmm. go in this very, like, one-minded kind of, you know, thought process is, you know, you're not allowed yeah. to, you know, 
you're not allowed to be encompassing of everybody's opinions while still being able to get your point across, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I applaud y'all, you know, so much. I applaud so much, you know, because it takes a lot. It really does, especially when you're in a position where, you know, you're still living with your parents or, you know, you're still, like, trying to, you know, get by, you know, they're still taking care of you. So to have those hard conversations may feel nerve-wracking, right? Um, But they need to be had, and it is a blessing that those those conversations are, you know, happening in real time to us. I love it. Absolutely. And I appreciate it so much. uh, <laughs> do you think that? Do you, how do you think the next generation of people will start changing? Do you think it'll be through more educational or through conversations like these? I honestly think conversation. You know, I think yeah. there is a lot of education that needs to be decolonized. You know, I think a lot of our education mm-hmm. is um, stemming from one point of view. But I think while having conversation and having conversation with people who who um, have those um, lived experiences, you will get the history out of it. You know, you'll get the education yeah. out of it. You'll see where it's coming from and stemming from. Um, while education, you know, you're trusting some people who may have not had, you know, those experiences mm-hmm. and they are very biased. Um, so I think, you know, talking to people who are those experiences. I think, you know, um, GLAD did a, um, a, um, I think a survey and found that like 80% of people don't know a trans person, right? Don't know, don't talk, don't interact. And, you know, that shows, you know, within how people interact with trans people. So I think, you know, getting to know people and, you know, getting the education or the history from those people who are living those experiences, um, really will activate, you know, um, how we move forward with protests, how we move forward with creating change and creating a new normal because, you know, we can't go back to what was before, you know. Um, I think it's easy to slide back to go back to before, but we we can't. We we can't. This is the momentum Mm -hmm. that needs to keep going and become part of our lifestyle, you know. Protests should become part of our lifestyle, you know. Banding Mm -hmm. together should become part of what we're doing. Are there any books or films or documentaries that you would recommend that as you experiences rather than articles on, you know? Absolutely. I think there's there's so many. Um, um, I think reading, you know, people like Angela Davis, um, Mm -hmm. I think reading people like Michelle Alexander, uh, Alexander, I think it is, um, you know, books like Our Prisons Are Obsolete or The New Jim Crow or... Um, you know, looking at, at you know, um, these new scholars um, who are coming up or these people who are just have people of experiences, um, people like, you know, Alok, um, amazing, you know, queer officer that we call them. Um, who else? Like Hope Giselle, who's a black trans woman who really speaks about experience. Um, as a black yeah. trans woman, you know, um, so many people who, um, who, you know, had to fight for their platforms, right, or to be seen mm-hmm. as somebody who's a scholar or an expert in their film. You know, I think when you have people who are driven like that and are passionate like that, you know, those are the people that we want to learn from. Those are the people that yeah. we want to um, lead our movement because um, that kind of passion is not something that was, you know, given to them, you know, for a check price, you know, like, you know, as you know, we have some kind of, you know, collegiate people who are, you know, are more book read or, you know, who have studied in these, you know, um, in these huge colleges, you know, some of them don't have the experience, you know, and they're just kind of yeah. based on what they've read, but I think you have those people who are doing the ground work lived those things, I think that makes that that exchange that much better. So, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, those are the people that we want to learn from. They are the people that yeah. we want to um, lead our movement because um, that kind of passion is not something that was, you know, 
given to them, you know, for a check price. You know, like that, you know, as you know, we have some kind of collegiate people who are, you know, are more book read or, you know, who have studied and do, you know, hmm. um, in these huge colleges, you know, some of them don't have the experience. You know, they're, and they're just kind of yeah. based on what they've read. But I think, you know, when you have those people who are doing the groundwork, who have, you know, lived those things, I think that makes that that exchange just that much better. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you personally gone out to the Black Lives protest? Um, I have. I've done um, a couple of them. Um, uh-huh. I think, you know, living in um, a COVID era has... Um, give me hesitancy, um, you know, just making sure that people who I live with and who I am, like, you know, interacting with are safe, um, but I um, show up as much as possible, you know, whether that's physically or, you know, with funds, you know, giving to these organizations that are putting them together and making sure mm-hmm. that their, um, their organizations are being funded and, you know, doing amazing great thing yeah it's definitely covid is a double-edged sword because as long as you get all of this media coming at you and people actually read it but don't go and participate because of covid and at least a lot lower numbers would would go and participate most definitely It's, it's the one of the most inspiring things to see that you know despite you know what's happening or what could happen, they're pushing through and really fighting. It's really, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) unexplainable. (laughs) (laughs) That's it from me, to be honest. I have run out of questions. Oh, my God. Well, thank you. This has been (laughs) absolutely amazing. (laughs) Thank you. It's been amazing for us as well. We're so, so honored to have you on our program and, Good luck in the future.